Over the next few sections, we're going to be working on installing MySQL on our system. We've chosen SUSE Linux because it's the suggested distribution from the MySQL team. In other words, it's the distribution that they test with most frequently. And as a result, we've elected to use it as well. But we do have other Linux systems on a network, including Red Hat, as well as other distros that we'll use when we illustrate other concepts. So as it stands, we're going to log into this box currently and log into the MySQL website to download the RPMs that we'll, in, we'll install on this system. Let's log in. We've created a user called LinuxCBT with a simple ABC123 password, non-difficult non password or a simplistic password for easy access. If you're following along, you should have a system that you have access to within your network. If you're following along from a Windows system, then simply putty in, use the putty SSH client to connect to your Linux box or your Linux distro of choice or perhaps even VNC in or use some other protocol. Now in typical Linux CBT fashion we'll take notes using a basic tool gedit. So let's launch gedit. We'll send it to the background using the ampersand and this will serve as our scratch space for taking notes or as our notepad. So let's label this particular document Linux CBT DBMS edition this is, of course, featuring the ubiquitous MySQL or MySQL, however you'd like to pronounce it, but the developers prefer that you use MySQL instead of MySQL, but commonly here in the U.S. you'll find that the pronunciation is MySQL rather than MySQL. So we're focusing on the database management system that's become ubiquitous and is used by many large websites. The version that ships with the current release of the Linux distro is version 4.1, which was the last major release prior to the 5 series. We'll need to download version 5 from the developer's website, my, mysql.com, and if your system has MySQL, an older version installed, you, you'll need to simply remove it. You can check since SUSE or Red Hat or other RPM-based distros use RPM technology for managing packages using the RPM utility. A simple RPM query all grep with a case insensitive search grep-i will yield, followed by MySQL will reveal if there are any packages with the name MySQL in it, including the client packages or any of the server packages. You could simply grep for SQL and you'll see that there are other packages installed but they're unrelated to MySQL, which tells us that the vanilla installation of our SUSE box does not include MySQL versions 4 or 5 or even the older version 3x series. That's great. Now before we go downloading anything from the website, let's just show you some of the details of this system. It is a dual processor system. Let's SU in and we'll cat proc CPU info, CPU info to get a sense for the processing power. It's a dual processor system with hyperthreading, so it appears to be four processors. Processors within Linux systems, x86 or any other architecture are indexed at zero. So here you can see information related to the first processor, the second through the fourth, and it really physically has two 2.4 gigahertz Xeon processors. So this is considered a mid-range database system, or depending on the size of your environment, perhaps a departmental level database management system. It's beefy enough. Even more important than processing power is the amount of memory on the system, which we can reveal using the free command. We'll use the M option, and this system doesn't have too much memory, but the databases that we'll be working with don't require much memory since we're simply illustrating concepts and not necessarily crunching reams of data. So we have about 512 megs of memory. It'll suffice for our demonstrations, but for any DBMS system that you're likely to deploy within your environment, you'll certainly want to cons consider at least one gigabyte or more, and preferably two gigabyte and higher. 
If you need more than 4 gigabytes, consider using AMD-based processors or Xeon 64-bit processors with larger memory sets. And then you could simply download a 64-bit based version of your favorite Linux distro since the 2.6 series kernel supports 64-bit technology and you'll be able to make use of the added memory to the system. So we have what appears to be four processors although we really have physically two processors with hyper threading turned on, half a gig of memory and as far as disk storage is concerned let's execute df-h and you'll see that our system's partitioned in a pretty simple setup. Let's see what we've got available here. We have a root partition that has 21 gigabytes available and you'll see we have a tempfs mount point which is really a memory or in memory location so it's a temporary mount point we have devs SDAs 1, SDC 1 and SDA 3 and the largest partition space SDC 1 has approximately 28 gigabytes free so this is the ideal place to store databases on our system. So when we install MySQL perhaps we'd place a partition on data 5 or we could use the root partition. Depending on how large you expect your data sets to grow will determine where you'll place your databases. So let's move on. We know that we have ample storage on the system 24 gigs plus 29. So far it looks as if we have a good 75 or more gigabytes on the system and that's clearly the case. Now in order to, to download MySQL version 5 we need to navigate to the MySQL website. Let's launch a browser and in our notes file which we'll simply mark up here we'll call this section installing MySQL 5.x. We're going to roll with version 5.0 which is considered the current production version although 5.1 is in alpha as of early 2006. 5 is the main series and the, the most current version is 5.018. That's the one we're going to download. So let's navigate to MySQL or MySQL.com and atop the page we'll see a link for the developer zone. This is where we will want to focus most of our time and energy because this is where we'll be able to download the MySQL code which includes the RPMs and or TarGZ images as well as any documentation that you may find helpful for the plethora of features that are included with the MySQL DBMS system. It certainly supports a lot of features including clustering as well as triggers, stored procedures and other enterprise level features. But we'll be using most of the basic features and then later on we'll move to integrate MySQL with PHP with an emphasis on integrating with PHP. So this is the developer zone and in the upper left you'll see the downloads link and you'll also see that as of early 2006 5.1 is considered an alpha release. So depending on when you're using this product you may or may not want to download version 5. If 5.1 is considered production when you're using this software feel free to download 5.1. 5.1 will con contain additional features but will retain the overwhelming majority of features included with 5.0 so at least 95 percent of the features you'll find in 5.0 will be in 5.1 and maybe even a higher number. We're not exactly sure at this stage but we're going to use the generally available version rather than an alpha release and even if you are using this particular product Linux CBT DBMS edition featuring MySQL at a later point 5.0 may be the version that's bundled with your favorite Linux distribution. For example, with SUSE 10, the developers have included version and or the packages of SUSE 10 have included version 4.1 of MySQL rather than version 5.0. So it takes a good year to two before you'll find the later releases being streamlined into the distros for you to use. So you'll find that version 5 will be around for a pretty long time just as you'll find that version 3.2 or 3.x is used quite widely out there. We'll click on version 5 and once we navigate to this area you'll see the sections for downloading it. 
You simply pick your operating system of choice. MySQL does run on Windows as well as many other platforms including Solaris and FreeBSD. It isn't a Linux only DBMS, although some may think it is. It's available for the major platforms including Windows. You have the option to download TarGZ images as well as RPM packages. If you're using an RPM based distribution such as SUSE, then proceed to the download area for the RPMs rather than the TarGZ images because the TarGZ images require a lot of work to get all of the programs into their respective directories on your file system. Not to mention you'll also have to find a sample start script, stop script for the distro that you're using and it just takes a lot more work. RPMs take care of the majority of that work for you and allow you to install and maintain your packages much much easier. So whenever possible download a binary RPM or the binary RPM set for your distro and we'll scroll down you'll see shortly that there are RPMs for Red Hat Enterprise Linux version 3 and 4, 4 being the current and then beneath Red Hat you'll find RPMs that are for the SUSE system. Now these RPMs are for Enterprise SUSE version 9 but they work properly within SUSE 10. We can confirm our version of SUSE by simply navigating to the shell and catting etc SUSE release and it's a case sensitive file as all files are within a Linux space and you can see we're running version 10. So the RPMs that are available for Enterprise SUSE 9 work perfectly. We've tested them with SUSE Linux 10. So not much has changed in terms of scripts and directory layout so you can feel comfortable in installing the version 9 Enterprise server packages on your SUSE 10 if you are using SUSE 10. Now if you're in a corporate setting and have acquired Linux with your servers, chances are likely you would have also acquired your distro of choice with the server, such as with a Dell or an HP or an IBM or any other server for that matter. And as a result, you will more than likely have an enterprise flavor of the Linux distro. And if that is the case, and you are using SUSE then it's more than likely to be version 9. Now again we're using SUSE Linux because this is the flavor or the distro of choice for the MySQL development team. It's not that MySQL doesn't work perfectly well on other distros, it's just that more testing is done on SUSE Linux but it certainly works well on other distros as well. So all the lessons that we cover here are applicable certainly to the other distros that are more popular such as Red Hat. But SUSE is right up there in terms of popularity. Now there are many packages to contend with. Next we're going to talk about the different packages that you see here that we can download to our system. We'll download them and then proceed with installation. Now we're ready to download the packages from the website. We're going to click on each of the packages that you see here and then discuss the meaning or purpose behind each of the packages while they're being downloaded since they will take a little while to come down. So let's start with the server. Server is perhaps or arguably the most important component. We'll go ahead and download it. We'll click on pick a mirror and notice the MD5 sum right beneath it which will confirm before installing any of the RPMs. You can optionally register with MySQL and they reserve the right then to contact you to market their products. That's certainly something you may want to consider doing if you are considering leading your organization towards open source including MySQL's database technologies. Now the website, the developers website of MySQL uses GOIP to determine the region of the world that your or our host system is located in and it's all based on IP address since IP blocks are designated to certain regions GeoIP and services like GeoIP can determine where the client is located and as a result return enough logic to the developers website for them to be able to determine which mirrors should serve us best. So the mirrors that you see here are ideal mirrors in terms of proximity and we should choose one of them unless you have others in mind or have the RPM packages on some other media. 
We'll go with Redwire, located in San Diego, and we'll use HTTP because it tends to return the files much, much quicker. Now, you can just simply copy the link and use a program such as WGET to download the RPM to the location of your choice on your file system or simply click on the link and wait for it to come up so the server is coming down and it's coming down pretty quickly we can confirm the rate it's about half a megasecond which is pretty quick so let's go back and we'll find or that's actually a little bit less but it's moving pretty quickly let's go back and find the links for the other RPMs we need to also get the client package now MySQL is a client server DBMS system as for the most part all DBMS systems on the market are today it contains client as well as server components the client can virtually be anywhere and so can the server but generally you'll have fewer servers than clients or more clients than servers. For each client who needs connectivity to the server, they'll require either the native MySQL client, which includes a basic shell interface, and when we say shell, we mean a terminal that runs within a shell, or GUI-based shells, which are available from MySQL and third parties. We're going to download the basic client because we're going to spend a great deal of time exploring the MySQL terminal monitor to get a sense for managing the DBMS using the terminal monitor before exploring other methods of managing your DBMS. So let's go ahead and click on the download for the client. We'll skip the registration section and simply navigate to a close mirror. And since the server has completed its download, we'll use Redwire again and HTTP again. We prefer HTTP because it tends to be faster in terms of authentication. Not necessarily in terms of download rate, but just in terms of how fast the server returns a response to our client. The client being the web browser, of course. So while the client comes down, let's go ahead and download the headers and libraries. These are files that other programs on the system use when they need MySQL support. And there are many programs. I'll give you an example. Snort, for example, makes use of logging using DBMS technology provided by programs such as MySQL and PostgreSQL and as a result you'd need the header and library packages in order to interface programs such as Snort to MySQL. Let's go ahead and click on one of the other links. Now Redwire is lower on the list but since we've downloaded the client we will only have or maintain one session with the server so it shouldn't be too much of a big deal. It's not as if we're streaming large ISO images and multiple sessions thus consuming their bandwidth. And the last package is the shared libraries package. This particular RPM contains files or programs or libraries that all of the other programs, server and client programs rely upon. So these are shared libraries similar to DLLs within the Windows world that both server and client components rely upon and they're separated into a shared libraries RPM. Let's click on pick a mirror and pull it from Redwire yet again and we'll then have all four packages downloaded. Let's find Redwire, click on HTTP and the fourth package will be down subsequently. Now the default location is usually the desktop which can be accessed through the shell from the user's home directory when downloading programs within a SUSE environment. We'll wait for the link to come up and again you can always right button copy link location and from a shell if you have wget installed for example let's in a separate window navigate into our home directory if you had wget installed let's do a which wget you could simply execute a wget control shift v to paste the destination and as you can see it's being downloaded from the shell much quicker than the browser did for us so no need to wait for the browser we've already downloaded the package using wget so it's optional simply execute wget and paste the location of the rpm package and wget will fetch the program for you let's clear screen and we'll lsltr star rpm and there you'll see that we have four packages ready to be installed on the system. Now for the sake of neatness we should create a subdirectory 
we'll create one, we'll call it temp, and then we'll move star.rpm into temp, and then we'll change into the temp directory so we can work in a nice and clean directory. The reason why we want to organize our files is quite simple because you'll revisit this particular directory maybe in a week or two or maybe in a couple months and not remember the series or sequence of events that led to installing MySQL. Or you may simply just need a refresher for what you did on the system. So it's great to have things nice and neat in a separate directory. And this also comes or stems from working with TarGZ images which tend to explode into many subdirectories and many files. So things can get a bit messy. So rather than having things get messy, it's always a good idea to keep them in one place. With RPMs, they are not extracted into the current directory so things don't get messy so easily. But over time as you download more RPMs and updated RPMs, then things become messy, so it's a good idea to keep things nice and organized using the file system. So there are four packages as mentioned. Let's return to the MySQL website, back to the download page, and these packages include the server, client, headers and libraries, and shared libraries packages. There are also packages for 64-bit based technology, including AMD and Intel. So if you're running a system that's 64-bit capable, such as Xeon 64-bit or AMD, then you'll want to download the 64-bit packages. They are different platforms, although x86 32-bit and Intel EM 64T come from the same company, architecturally the hardware differs, so you'll need to download the proper packages for your platform. You can confirm your platform quite easily. From a shell, as any user, execute the uname command followed by dash A. Dash A will reveal all of the information that uname can reveal, including the name of the host, the operating system, the version of the kernel 2.6, 13-15, being the major version of the kernel, 13 being a minor version, and 15 being a version incremented by the folks over at Novell followed by whether or not the kernel is a symmetrical multiprocessing kernel. In our case it is, and our system does have two physical processors with hyperthreading turned on, so they appear to be four processors. And additionally, you'll see when the kernel was compiled. This is when the kernel for SUSE 10 was compiled. And more importantly, you'll see the platform information. I686, I386, 586 is all the same platform. It's all 32-bit base. Had this been a 64-bit base system, then you wouldn't see I686 or I386. Similar to compiling Linux on a Spark system, the uname command would reveal that the kernel was compiled for Spark rather than for 686 or 386 or AMD 64 or Intel 64. So the bottom line is download the packages that are appropriate for your hardware platform. And again, there are four main packages. The server, which contains the main MySQL binary daemon, which runs as the server called MySQLD. The client RPM package, which contains many packages, which will be going, or many programs, that is, within the package that we'll be going through, including the MySQL client, MySQL admin, MySQL dump, and a series of other programs. So in our notes file, let's simply record that MySQL consists of primarily four RPM packages. They include the server RPM package, which contains server programs including MySQLD, client RPM package, which contains programs such as MySQL, which is the terminal monitor client program, which we'll be using extensively for interacting with the MySQLD server. This is a front-end client which runs from a shell and can be run from any client that has a route or connectivity, TCP IP based connectivity to the MySQLD server. So in other words, you can run the client across your LAN or across the WAN, which includes the internet, or across a VPN connection. As long as the two systems, both client and server, can talk across the network, you'll run MySQL client on the client 
and the MySQL D daemon on the server. Now, both programs can be run on the same host, but MySQL, the client, will still use TCP IP to communicate with the server MySQL D. But it's important to understand the concepts, client server, simple client server concepts. The fact that many clients can communicate with the same backend MySQL D daemon and execute independent autonomous queries against the system. The system being managed, of course, by the DBMS MySQL D. This is the main program, which is included within the server RPM package. So other client RPM packages include MySQL admin, which allows us to perform administrative tasks against the MySQL D daemon, including changing your password and other things that you'll see that are quite useful. MySQL dump, and we'll just simply mention etc. because there are many other programs that we'll discuss. We've also got a headers and libraries which is the package back here libraries package and this is required for compilation or we should simply say provides mysql support for third party apps for example, if you have a program such as Snort, which can log its information to MySQL directly, Snort is able to do so by linking to the headers and libraries included within the headers and libraries package. Let's list this as headers and libraries package, RPM package that is. And again, all of these programs are included whether or not you download RPMs or the TarGZ images. You get them either way. It's just that with RPMs, the programs are neatly organized and separated amongst the main classes or categorized by these different classes, such as server client headers and libraries and shared libraries. Now, the last note is we have a package for shared, which contains shared libraries. RPM package and this particular RPM package contains libraries that are common to MySQL server and client programs so rather than distribute duplicate copies of libraries amongst the different programs server and client there's one package which contains those shared libraries. Makes total sense. For example, you may intend to install MySQL D server on one system and perhaps the client on a different system. But you may need libraries from the shared package for both of the packages or both of the programs that are installed, server and client. Well, rather than bundling the libraries twice with both the server and client packages, the folks who prepare the RPMs simply leave it up to the administrator of the system to decide whether or not to install the shared libraries program. So if there's a need or dependency for libraries that the server and client programs share, then you simply install the shared libraries package. So separate or don't confuse the shared libraries package with the headers and libraries package. The headers and libraries package provides third party support for programs such as Snort that can interact with MySQL. It provides the hooks, the libraries, like DLLs within the Windows world so that those programs can tap into the power of MySQL. Drivers and so on are provided whereas shared libraries are used between server and client based packages that are inclusive to MySQL. So we have the four packages downloaded in our system and we don't have MySQL install. You can also check even though we did an RPM check by executing a netstat NTL and usually if MySQL is installed you'd see port 3306 being bound to or bound to on the system. 
in this case you don't see 3306 it is TCP based and we don't see it which also tells us that it's not running now it isn't a foolproof way of testing because certainly an administrator could change the default port in which MySQL binds but nonetheless it's a quick test for you to determine whether or not it's running an NTLP would reveal the names of the programs bound to the different TCP ports. In our case, it's nice and clean, so we have nothing to worry about. So it isn't installed, and next we're going to proceed with installing simply the server, and then on to the clients and other shared packages to get a sense for how MySQL can be deployed on the system. So now that we have our packages downloaded and we've talked a bit about how each of the packages are distinct or the fact that they contain different components with the exception of the shared libraries package which contains libraries that are to be shared it's time for us to confirm that the packages that we downloaded are indeed the same cryptographically correct package that was delivered to us from the dev.mysql.com website before installation. So in other words, we want to perform checks against files that are downloaded across the internet to ensure that the files had not been tampered with in transit. That is one of the basic uses of the MD5SUM program and you'll find that across the internet, especially with open source programs, the MD5 sums are provided so that you can ensure that you have a package that came from the actual distributor. Even with Linux CBT, for example, if you were to download an ISO image from our website, there is an accompanying MD5 sum that you can use to confirm that you did in fact receive Linux CBT from us and not from someone else. The MD5 sum is unique to the build or to a given file, if the file changes even one bit, it will reflect a different MD5 sum indicating to you that something has gone awry in transit. So our job is, is to do at this stage is to compare the MD5 sums that are displayed on this website with the results of running MD5 sum against each RPM package that's downloaded. So let's simply label this section as confirm MD5 sums for each downloaded RPM package. And that's quite simple. Let's paste the first MD5 sum, and this is for the server package. So for server, we should, when we run MD5 sum, return an exact match to this string that you see here. And in order to do so, simply execute a which MD5 sum. It's always installed. If it isn't, install it. But it's always installed with most, if not all, distributions so that we know that it's on the system. And then we'll execute MD5 sum against the server package by simply executing MD5 sum space MySQL dash server. This will run very quickly on small files. It'll take a little longer on larger files, such as with the Linux CBT ISO images especially the DVD images for example but if you have a pretty fast system it returns relatively quickly here is a string that's returned by the MD5 sum installed on our system because MD5 sum uses the same algorithms across the board when you execute it against the same program on one system and the same program on a totally different system regardless of architecture the package should retain return the same MD5 sum which means the file has not changed or the program or the package that is that you've downloaded has not been altered in transit by some other program or rogue program or by a user so let's copy this string and paste it into the gedit window and we'll simply compare the values. You can start by comparing the leftmost values and just work your way through towards the end and you'll see that value for value, place for place, the values are the same. So this particular RPM package is checked out correctly. Let's move on to the next MD5 sum. And this is certainly something you should do. You should just make this your practice to confirm MD5 sums whenever downloading anything off the internet. Don't trust anything that you download until you've confirmed MD5 sums. And if possible, use GPG to confirm the signatures whenever the signatures are available of files that you've downloaded from the net. It's just an, an additional way of 
assuring you that the file hasn't changed or is from the person who actually formed or created the package or program that you're downloading. Now we want to confirm the client. So according to the MySQL website, the client's MD5 sum or the client packages MD5 sum is a string that you see there. Notice it's a totally different value from the server RPMs string. We'll need to confirm using MD5 sum again, so we'll simply execute MD5 sum against MySQL dash client and the exact same value should be returned. Let's return to gedit, paste it, tab over and just compare the values column for column and as you can see it's all identical. Now there's an easier way to do this. You could output the values into two separate text files and use a program such as diff to compare the two text files to determine whether or not there's been any changes and that would save you some time. But since we're only confirming four files it isn't a big deal. Let's move on to headers and libraries and by now you should get the picture that we're just going to do this for each of the, the packages that we've downloaded. So for headers and libraries we have an MD5 sum which matches whatever you see there and we'll execute MD5 sum against our local MySQL dash devel. That's a devel package by the way just so that you know the shared package contains the shared library shared among server and client programs but the devel package which is standard with most RPM based distros such as Red Hat and Suzy to label header packages with a name including the keyword devel for example. Let's execute MD5 sum and we'll rip the string and paste it into gedit to quickly confirm and let's just move it directly beneath the MD5 sum we copied from the dev.mysql website. And as you can see this matches so we have no problem thus far with three out of four packages. We'll move on finally to shared libraries. Let's get the MD5 sum from the website for the shared libraries. And again, these MD5 sums differ for each package. Any program, any file that's created on the distributor's side, in this case MySQL, will have its own or its own unique MD5 sum. So even if it's the same version of the program, if it's compiled into a new file, let's say the 64-bit version, it's a totally different file and as a result reflects a totally different MD5 sum value. Let's execute MD5 sum against the final package MySQL dash shared. Copy the string and then paste it into gedit. And once we have this into gedit, we'll be able to determine very quickly whether or not we are on the right track. And as you can see, so far so good. So what MD5 sum does for us is it confirms whether or not the file has changed any in transit. For example, emails tend to traverse systems and are subject to change. If a file traverses an email system which tampers with the contents of the message, its MD5 sum is likely to change. So a lot can happen between you receiving the file from a distributor and you actually confirming that file in your local file system. By the time it actually gets to your local file system, a man in the middle of an attack could have transpired causing changes in the file. For example, it's highly unlikely, but it is still likely because we're so interconnected and rely upon the infrastructure that is public, and that is part of the problem, yet also part of the beauty. So we've confirmed all four key packages and we're now ready to install the server package. Now we're going to begin with the server package because the server package does not require, at least for version 5.x, does not require that we install other packages such as client, headers and libraries, and shared libraries. So we can go ahead and install the server package, get it up and running, and then proceed to installing additional packages to interact with the server. Because you'll see that once we have the server installed, we won't be able to interact with it without actually installing some sort of client or connecting to a system which has the client installed. So to in, in order to install the server, we simply execute an RPM and we'll do so as root because the non-privileged user, Linux CBT, doesn't have enough privileges. So we're going to execute RPM and we have the option of using 
uppercase U, lowercase VH, or IVH. UVH, or uppercase U, lowercase VH, is used when a package potentially exists on the system and you're instructing RPM to update the version of the program that's currently installed. If you want to be on the safe side, use UVH, which will force RPM to update any existing versions of the same program. However, if you're absolutely sure that the program is currently not installed, then go with IVH. In our case, we're sure because we didn't we performed an RPM query all, and we piped the output to grep, and grep told us that MySQL is currently not installed. Now, what do we mean by RPM query all? When you execute an RPM query all, all the packages that are currently installed in the system are dumped to the screen. These are the names of the different packages which constitute our RPM based SUSE system. RPM distros such as SUSE and Red Hat consist of packages or RPMs. So pretty much all of the files and programs that we interact with including the GNOME package which gives us these pretty windows belong to one or more programs or packages that is within the SUSE distribution or any other distribution so you can tell a lot about the packages that are installed in the system so an RPM query all dumps the list of packages if we were to pipe the output to a program such as word count and use the L option it'll tell us that we have pretty much 787 packages installed on the system we're about to add about four more so that's what RPM query all does for us so since the list is dumped to the screen we can pipe the output into a program such as grep which performs searches on a line by line basis so we could search let's say for example for Suzy help which we know is a package that's installed and we'll grep Suzy help and you'll see that because grep parses output especially ASCII based output on a line by line basis wherever RPM's output matches Suzy help will cause grep to dump it to our screen so in this case we have two packages that are named similarly to Suzy help or contain Suzy help in, in their names so similarly when we grep using a case insensitive search and it's important because as you can tell the MySQL packages use two cases upper and lower so we tend to search using case insensitive searches grep i and that's lowercase i these options are case sensitive as are most things within unix and linux environments so grep i mysql will tell us whether or not there's anything installed in our system which contains mysql in the name of the package and as you can see there's nothing installed an echo of the output returns a non-zero value indicating that the most recently run program was unsuccessful so in other words grep was unable to find in RPM's output anything matching MySQL which means it's not on the system which means we can then use RPM IVH to install MySQL server this will install it for us and again note that we're doing or installing the version that's available for SUSE Enterprise Linux version 9. So let's go ahead notice that it says it's preparing and relatively quickly the server is installed on the system and in addition another key for you to know is that when you do install version 5.x by default the program is started so as you can see towards the bottom the output registers that MySQL has been started so now a netstat will reveal that MySQL is running which leads or brings up a whole separate can of worms that we'll need to discuss and rectify soon enough related to security but that information is partially dumped to the screen so by virtue of installing MySQL server it's started by default and it's in what is considered to be an insecure state because anyone can connect to the instance but in this case there isn't much to worry about because the default databases are not important here's a tip on how to change the password for the root user by default roots password is unset it's blank which means any user can connect to the MySQL instance and add drop or do anything to the database management system we can use one of the utilities provided MySQL admin which is not included by the way with the server package it's only included with the client package to update the password for the server here are many of the programs that are in, that are installed by default with the server but are considered to be server-side programs MySQL bug 
MySQL D, which is the daemon that was just started, as well as Hot Copy, which allows us to copy databases, a test program, and other programs that are server side programs, a safe way to start MySQL D, etc. Now, how can we confirm that MySQL is running? Many ways. We can use PS, which will list the currently running processes. PSAX, grep, case insensitive is always wise. And search for MySQL, and you'll see that it is running. Safe, as well as normal, MySQL D is up and running with two separate process IDs. With all sorts of other useful information, such as where MySQL will store its data. So the data directory defaults to varlib MySQL, which tells us a lot which means if we were to quickly look at var lib mysql you'll see that there are entries there and you'll find that with mysql the database or the databases that are under management are stored in separate directories there are two databases installed by default one is called test which is accessible to all users on the system including root as well as anonymous users and another one's mysql which is used for managing the dbms similar to the master database within a SQL environment. The MySQL database is used for management, so it means it stores, for example, usernames, passwords, etc. The, the names of databases that are under management and so on. So by simply running a PSAX you can tell whether or not MySQL is running and you can tell where it's serving databases from, where on your system it's serving it from. You can also tell the user under which it runs, where the PID file is stored if in case you have scripts such as log rotate running that will cause MySQL to restart or reload and any other features that may or may not be useful which we'll explore later on. So the server is up and running but guess what? We can't connect to the server because we don't have a client. So we've yet to install the client. So let's go ahead and save the document that we've been taking our notes in. And next we're going to actually install the client. We're going to save this particular document as Linux CBT DBMS Edition Notes.txt. And by the way, this particular text file, however useful, is located in the docs subdirectory on the DVD so you can reference it in the event that you just want to go through some of the steps pretty quickly such as the steps for installing what the packages mean checking out MD5 sums anything we do will simply dump into this text file as a quick reference point so next we install the client and then we begin connecting to the server so we've gotten the server installed we want to proceed with installing the client again if you're following along this is the right or suggested way of installing MySQL components. You install the server first and again server and clients don't need to be one and the same but often you'll find that as a Linux MySQL administrator you'll SSH into a box using SSH as your main or primary management interface or shell and you'll want to be able to administer the DBMS directly and in order to do so you'll need a client program. Optionally you could run the client program from your desktop either a GUI or shell base program but if you're proficient with the shell you'll get a lot done very quickly using a very thin client. So aim to understand how the terminal monitor works. There's a huge market and huge opportunity for using the shell wherever possible. SSH as well as the MySQL terminal monitor so it helps to install both server and client components on the same box in some cases you may want to only run one component on one box and the other component on a different box in those cases fine then you'll want to separate the components and connect across the wire but you can use SSH connect using an encrypted channel across the wire and you're on the server you can run both components that way Either way, you'll need to know how to install them, and installation's pretty easy. Now, before we install the client, let's just see what footprint was left on the system by MySQL server. If we rerun RPM query all grep MySQL, you'll now see that there's one package installed, MySQL server standard. In order to see the list of files or the footprint left by this particular package on our system, simply copy 
the majority of the name. You don't need the version. Just copy the most unique portion of the name minus the numeric portion and execute an RPM query list against that name. Let's try to copy that again. In this case, it's MySQL Server Standard. And this will cause the RPM program to query its database, find this loan package, and list the full footprint of the program like we've just done. Now we'll pipe the output to less so we can see it one page full at a time and we'll briefly talk about some of the files that have been deposited in our system. As mentioned, when we installed the server program, it started by itself towards the end of the installation. So by virtue of in initiating an RPM IVH against the MySQL Server Standard program, it started. But how did it start? Well, because the package that we downloaded from DevMySQL was compiled in its binary form for the SUSE distribution, it includes a start script which works within the SUSE environment. And that start script was deposited by virtue of installation in the etc init.d or initialization directory. And its name is MySQL. If in a separate directory you navigate to etc init.d and take a brief look at the contents of the directory using lsltr, you'll see that there's an entry for MySQL. And this particular file is the start script. Now it's readable by all, by all users on the system, so we can execute less followed by MySQL. And you'll see it's basically a shell script which controls the starting, stopping, restarting in any particular way in which MySQL D will operate from the shell. This is the script. You can parse it. Feel free to peruse it to get a sense for how they do what they do. But Initialization scripts are pretty generic and can be found online and basically different program bundlers copy initialization scripts from one another and modify them slightly to meet their needs, including basic options such as start, stop, restart, reload, etc. There's also an entry in the logrotate.d directory created as a result of installing the server. MySQL creates log output and the log output can grow easily to gigabytes worth of information that you may want to rotate on some sort of recurring basis. If that is your desire, then in the logrotate.d directory you'll find a MySQL file which is world readable. If you cut the contents of MySQL, you'll see what this particular file instructs logrotate to do. Anything with hash mark is hash marks is considered to be a comment or something for the administrator of the system to read or to process. Anything without a comment is considered to be processed by the program that's in charge of the script. In this case, logrotate is responsible for all prog all scripts or all files within this directory. In this case, logrotate will rotate the mysql dot mysql d dot log file. It'll not rotate it if it's empty. It'll rot rotate it daily, rotate it for three days. If it's missing, it's okay. It'll compress it since the file is likely to grow very large on a busy production system. And after the rotation of the script, then MySQL will be checked using the MySQL admin program, which can ping instances of MySQL. So this is pretty interesting. What happens here is a test. This is a bash shell test to see whether or not the MySQL admin program exists on the system. This makes perfect sense because if you think about it, we just installed the server, but the server does not include the MySQL admin program. We attempted to find it. It didn't exist on the system. So a test is performed or carried out by the log rotate process to see whether or not the administrator of the system has installed the MySQL client program or our package which includes programs such as MySQL admin. If it exists, then MySQL admin issues a ping. The ping pings localhost by default. So MySQL admin will check itself. It'll send a ping to the local instance or the instance of MySQL running on the local host to see whether or not it's there. If it's up and running, then the logs are flushed. And then after the logs are flushed, MySQL is back in business. So in other words, log rotate rotates out the MySQL d.log file, but in order for MySQL to begin writing to the new log file, it needs to be flushed. But before it can be flushed, 
there is a check to see whether or not the admin program has been installed. If it hasn't been installed, then MySQL will continue to write to the old file. And that's not necessarily a good thing. The global configuration file within a Unix-based environment is located in ETC, and it's called my.cnf. This file contains global directives. Let's take a brief look at my.cnf. In this case, it's not installed with the server file. So it appears to have been installed with the server package, but it wasn't. And it isn't a permissions issue if we were to SU into the system. And try to take a look at etc my.cnf you'll see that the file does not exist. So that's one little gotcha, but it's not a big deal. So my.cnf is installed when we install the client package. And there are other programs that we'll discuss later on in our studies that are included primarily with the server package, including the hot copy program, the isem check, isem log, isem pack, documentation, the main daemon itself. This is the program, MySQLD a way to start it safe, resolve IP, and other key programs that we'll take a look at. We'll go through, for the most part, most of these programs. There's documentation and user shared doc packages, MySQL server standard. If you intend to run the database server in a large configuration, medium or small, here are sample CNF files. And by the way, these CNF files can be copied to etc my.cnf, and the server will process them upon start which is something else we'll also discuss, the order in which MySQL D will process files that are found throughout the system. So we've briefly gone through some of the files that you can expect to find on the system. There aren't too many of them when you install just a server package alone, but know that the admin program is a part of the client package, which we will be looking at once we install it. So that's what we want to do now. Let's move on to that. So in our notes, we've briefly discussed installing a server so one install server and we did so doing by doing an rpm ivh my sql server standard and we'll just say star now we want to install client and similarly we will execute an rpm ivh and let's just get the proper name of both packages for the client its client standard and its version number and these are labeled consistently so you don't have to worry about making a mistake or finding the program that you're looking for the package that you're looking for that is for the program let's get the exact name for the server package and let's replace our scratch and now we want to move on to executing the RPM command that we've just placed here. This will attempt to install the client package on our system. Let's paste it, Control Shift V. We are in as root, so we should have no problems, and the client package has been installed. Let's clear screen and will RPM query all grep MySQL. You'll now see that there are two packages, the client being the second, and then we will run an RPM query list and the name of the program we just copied to memory and we'll pipe the output to less and as you can see everything fits on one page so we don't need the less output so let's just dump it to the screen here are the programs included with the client package these are the programs that we'll use to talk to a version 5 MySQL server either located locally and or remotely they include the main MySQL client it's simply named MySQL without a trailing D, which is reserved for the server. There's a client test, a find rows program, table info, wait PID, SQL access, SQL admin, which is a key administrative tool that we'll be using, bin log, MySQL check, SQL dump, another key tool which allows us to back up databases that are under management by the DBMS that you connect to. Now, by the way, all these client programs will connect to a server either locally and or remotely. You simply specify some key options that we'll be showing you in subsequent sections, such as the user in which to connect as, as well as the server in which to connect to. So we'll be specifying servers and even optionally port in the event that the server is listening to a non-standard port, non-standard being anything other than the default 3306. All these client programs can connect locally and or remotely.
If you come from a Windows world, think of these programs or this hodgepodge of programs as the equivalent of using SQL's, that's Microsoft's SQL's Enterprise Manager, which allows you to connect to various servers locally, remotely, and so on, as well as Query Analyzer. These are programs which provide similar functionality. You'll use primarily, however, the MySQL client for connecting, for going, entering into terminal monitor mode, as well as entering into batch mode, which allows you to execute a series of commands. And these are dynamic data commands, such as SQL commands, create, drop, select, and so on, using the MySQL client program. But there are ancillary programs which perform distinct functions such as MySQL dump, MySQL admin. Now all these programs support help as well as multiple options. So for example, we could simply execute a MySQL help using dash dash help and you'll see many options return to the screen, almost too many to discuss with the key ones being whether or not to be prompted for a password as well as which user to connect to the server as, as we've mentioned as well as which server to connect to, which can be specified using the H option over here. And if not specified, the default is the local host. And then optionally, after you've specified options using short or long options, this is considered a long option with the double dashes or a short option, which has a single dash, you can then specify as the first argument the database in which to perform the operations on. So you may want to send a command such as select all data or all columns from a given table in a batch fashion rather than going into or entering interactive mode. But there's a lot to talk about. Bottom line is we're going to work with MySQL client first get accustomed to the terminal environment as well as batch mode. Once we've completed our studies of the MySQL client, then we'll move on to the other useful utilities included with the client package. Once we've cleared the client package, then we'll move on to programs that are included with the server, and then we'll move on to other things we can do with MySQL before then digging into integrating MySQL with PHP.